In this video, I've got a brand new tool to share with you that's going to help you get better results when you're grading footage that comes from a Phantom camera. Now, if you've ever worked with this camera before, you might have noticed that it's not the most color management friendly camera. I don't exactly know why this is, but my best guess is that because it's an older camera that's been around for quite a few years now, and color management wasn't nearly as common of a practice when the camera was released, the manufacturer may simply have never gone back and made sure that they're providing a full color management path to users of the camera and to people who are working with footage that comes from the camera. But regardless of the reason, there's kind of like this workflow hole in terms of working with phantom footage inside of Resolve and even other color grading systems that leaves us in a pretty tricky situation in terms of getting a sound baseline reproduction of the image so that we can grade with the best possible foundation underneath us. So before I show you this new tool, this new solution, let's take a look at the current state of affairs inside of Resolve and how we can go about color managing phantom footage as best we're able to with the stock tools available to us within Resolve. So before I dive into this phantom footage that I've got here living in most of the timeline, let's just do a quick recap of what we should expect when we color manage an image. So right now we're looking at a camera original log state of our image that's had nothing at all done to it. And as a result, it looks very flat, very low contrast, very low saturation. It's really in a state that was never meant for viewing at all, right? Now what's gonna happen if we turn on our color management? I'm gonna right click on this thumbnail and unbypass my color management or effectively enable my color management and watch what happens. All of a sudden we've got a healthy amount of contrast and saturation in the image and a good foundation from which we can begin to grade, right? That's what we should expect when we are color managing our image. Now let's do the exact same experiment with some of these phantom shots that I have here. I'm gonna go over here to shot number two and I'm gonna unbypass my color management and when I do this, I'm effectively going to get the best and only color management for phantom footage that I am able to get within Resolve's native color management tool set or framework, okay? So let's watch what happens when we unbypass this. It's not quite the same thing, right? Like, yeah, there's some more contrast in there, there's some more saturation, but it kind of feels weird, right? Even before I begin doing anything with my hands, like the contrast in the bottom end still feels a little bit soft maybe, and the biggest thing that I notice is the highlights. Like they feel hot and like they're getting close to clipping, even though when I look at my histogram, they're really not anywhere near the ceiling of the container, right? So if I were to go from here and start actually trying to grade this up, I would end up maybe somewhere like this, okay? So like healthy level of contrast and saturation and stuff. And like we could call that my primary grade for this image. But the weird thing to me that I've, felt for years working with phantom footage that I'm color managing in this way is that my highlights feel all at the same time, not bright enough, but also like kind of clipped out. So like there's not much detail in uh, this uh, right hand side uh, of the camera right hand side that is of the subject's forehead. Uh, but it's also like not particularly hot in the histogram. Like I can see the red channel is starting to get up there a little bit, but it just feels weird because now if I start to pull that back, I'm like, okay, there's some detail coming back in there but now it feels like very flat and subdued, right? So kind of an odd solution, feels weird to look at before you do anything at all. And uh, you can take my word for it if you haven't worked with phantom footage, or if you have, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about, that once you start to put your hands on it, something about it just feels funky, right? The reason for that is because the color management, the solution that the camera manufacturer have provided that Resolve has implemented is actually not really correct for the camera. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. But for now, let's just zoom out, grab a still of this, and then take one more crack at the same idea here on this other phantom shot. I'm gonna right click on this thumbnail, unbypass my color management, and once again, get the best color management available to me within Resolve for footage that was shot on a phantom. And I'm getting a similar thing. Like the contrast doesn't really feel right in the low end, and it feels kind of like simultaneously clippy and like, too low in the high end, right? So again, if I just kind of like feel it out of my hands and start making these adjustments here, I can get it to a decent place. This is without even touching color balance or saturation or anything like that. But let's just keep it really simple and say like, okay, you know, like that's, that's not bad, right? So we'll grab a still on that. Now, we've just taken a look at the best solution Resolve has to offer in terms of color managing phantom footage. And as I've said, 
feels kind of weird, looks kind of weird. And if you've ever worked with it, I think you're probably going to agree with me that it's something in it is a little bit funky, right? But that's not where the drawbacks end. There's actually two other really big drawbacks, even to this compromised solution. The first one is that if you want this color management that Resolve is offering for phantom footage, you actually have to be color managing in your project settings. This cannot be accomplished by color managing in nodes within Resolve. Now, I prefer to color manage in nodes. We are going to be color managing exclusively in nodes here on the channel going forward. I think it's faster. I think it's more efficient. I think it's more intuitive. It's a better way to go. I definitely prefer to color manage in nodes. So that's a major drawback for me because it basically dictates my workflow to me from the outset simply so I can get a basic level of color management that I'm not even all that thrilled with. Here's the other, maybe even bigger drawback. Take a look at shots four, five, and six. These shots weren't shot in the phantom raw.cine format at all. This is a DNX file. This is a ProRes file. And there's actually nothing I can do to color manage these images, no matter how I'm setting up my color manage, my color management, that is. I simply have to color manage this by hand or lie to resolve and tell it that it's in some other camera color space because I cannot color manage it at all. I can't even take advantage of this compromise solution that Resolve has to offer. And again, I want to be clear, this isn't really an implementation problem with Resolve. This is more of a problem with the data that the camera manufacturer is providing or not providing so that a proper input transform can be created. And really what we're looking at here is an input transform failure. The input transform is really not doing its job even when we can use it. And because of the way that it is implemented in Resolve, we can't even use that input transform in a large number of situations where we would need to, like wanting to color manage in nodes or wanting to color manage footage that wasn't captured in a full raw state. Okay. So the solution that I have to offer you is going to solve all of these issues. It's going to get you a better baseline input mapping that doesn't feel weird in our hands. And it's going to allow us to color manage in nodes, if that's our preference, as well as to color manage footage regardless of whether or not it was actually shot in Phantom Raw Cine or uh, captured or transcoded to something like DNX or ProRes, okay? So we're going to build out the pipeline that lets us use this new tool, and we're going to kind of do it backwards, okay? We're going to start with our display and work our way back, but stick with me because we need to get all these pieces in place in order to take advantage of this new tool. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my project settings, and I'm going to go to my color management, and I'm going to go to my color science here, which is currently set to DaVinci YRGB color managed. I had it set here because I wanted us to evaluate the way that Resolve can color manage phantom footage. And as I said, the only way Resolve can color manage phantom footage is when I have my uh, color management set up here in my project settings. But my preference is to color manage in nodes. That's the way we're going to set up our color management here today. So in order to do that, I need to set my color science to DaVinci YRGB. DaVinci YRGB essentially means Resolve, don't help. I got this. I'm going to handle everything from this camera or this image's uh, original state and take it all the way out to its uh, display state, okay? And what I am going to do before I move on from here is simply tag my timeline color space to DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. That's always my timeline or my working color space when we're uh, going through our workflow here on the channel. And I'm going to set my output color space to Rec. 709 Gamma 2.2, okay? Now, these things, just want to emphasize, are not going to color manage the image for me. No matter where I set them, they're not going to directly impact the image or change the image. But what they are going to do is pass metadata through the Resolve system, and it's going to affect the behavior of certain tools, as well as uh, the tagging that uh, is placed in uh, outputs when we finally go to render our files. Okay, So it's good practice to set these things up, but this is not setting up color management. We're going to have to do that ourselves. And that's exactly what we want, so it's good news. So I'm going to hit save here. And what we're now going to do is, again, work backwards from display to camera. So for display, we want to go over to the timeline level of our node graph. You can do that by clicking this rightmost dot here, or by clicking this drop down and selecting timeline, like so. And what I want to do is create a color space transform that's going to get me out to Rec. 7 or 9. Now, I want to, again, work backwards. So let's start with our output. We're going to go Rec. 7 or 9. And for my gamma, I'm going to select gamma 2.2 because that's how I've set up this reference monitor here. Most of us are going to be viewing this on our laptops or on our phones or on our tablets. So gamma 2.2 is generally going to be a better fit for those devices than gamma 2.4, which I might normally use, which I certainly would use if I was in a traditional grading context working uh, with a client. Okay, But for today, we're going to go gamma 2.2. 
tone mapping, I'm going to go to luminance mapping and set these parameters like so. There's nothing magic or uh, set in stone about these things. It's just where I like to put them. And what we now need to do is set our input color space and gamma, right? Our input color space and gamma are going to be whatever our working color space is. As we said a moment ago, that's going to be DaVinci Wide Gamut and DaVinci Intermediate. And let's go back over here to shot number two. And about now, you're probably looking at this before versus after and going, wow, great, Cullen. You took an image that looked kind of funky and kind of flat and made it look really weird and really wrong. You're actually getting worse. Be patient with me. This is just the first, actually the last link in the chain. And we need to get one other link in the chain to complete it before this image is going to start to look good. Okay. So we've got our display side handle. We've got to transform this, taking us from our working color space out to our display color space. What needs to happen next? We need something that's going to move us from the color space of our camera and into our working color space. That's our input transform. That input transforms performance is what was causing the funkiness that we were just looking at a moment ago. Okay. So we're now going to implement the solution that I uh, am going to share with you guys today. I'm going to leave a link to it in the description for today's video. That's going to allow you to get a better input mapping of your image. Here's how I want to set this up. This is going to be the same way I would set up uh, my color management in nodes for any other camera. Just before I move on, I'm going to label this node out. Let's go back over to the clip level of our node graph. And I'm going to go ahead and reset my grades here on these shots because uh, my grading decisions are going to change once I've got this new color management in place. And let's go ahead and select all of our phantom shots. And I'm going to right click on these. And by the way, the way I've done that is I hit, uh, I clicked on uh, shot number two. I'm holding down shift and then hitting shot number six to select all of these. And now I'm going to right click and say add into a new group. We'll call this group phantom. Now watch what happens to these dots up here when I do this. Right now I've got these two dots, one for clip, one for timeline. Once I hit OK, I got four dots. I've got clip, timeline, and I've also got two new ones. Group post clip, which we're not going to mess with today, and group pre clip, which is where this custom input transform that I've created for you guys is going to live. Because that means that for any clip that is a member of this group, it is going to get hit first with whatever is happening here before we do any grading. That's perfect for us because we want to grade in our working space of DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate, and we want to input map into that space as the very first process for every single phantom shot that we have. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. Drum roll, please. We finally made it there. I'm going to go back over to my effects and go to DCTL and drop this onto an empty node. I'm now going to go to my DCTL drop down menu and look for CKC Phantom Log to DaVinci Wide Gamma 1.0. We're going to click that. And in this case, phantom log one is the right option. This dot cine file is indeed in log one. I can confirm that here in my camera raw. And now if I go over here to my primaries, let's do some grading. Let's take another crack at this thing. And I'm just going to kind of try to get a good foundation again, just using my lift, my gamma and my gain, like so. Okay. Now let's compare this to where we were just a moment ago. So it's not night and day, right? And you could even say that if this solution, the Resolve built-in solution was available in all situations, then maybe you could live with it and maybe you could grade through whatever differences that we're seeing here. But we now know that the solution is not available in a large number of situations where we would want it to be. And furthermore, we know that the highlight clipping thing that I was talking about before, the highlight weirdness is something that you're just gonna be fighting for the duration of the grade Whereas here in this grade that I've got set up here, I'm having a much easier time of getting sufficiently bright highlights without an excessive loss of detail. And that's really the weirdness that I uh, was experiencing in the shot in uh, my prior color management stack. And that's something I've experienced with so many phantom shots is like, wait, I want to drive it up, but it feels like it's clipping, but it feels like it's too flat if I don't drive it up. And it's like somehow flat and clipped all at once. I don't know how to explain it. In fact, I actually do know how to explain it because we've remeasured this camera. That's how we came up with this input transform and came to a better result is because we actually characterized the behavior of the camera. Uh, I worked with my community to do this and uh, in particular with a really smart dude named Thatcher Freeman. You should check out uh, his channel if you haven't already. Lots of cool stuff on there um, who did a lot of this, this uh, profiling and implementation. But we discovered that this input transform that we're using 
quite different from the one that is published by the camera manufacturer. And because it is more accurate to the actual behavior of a camera that was measured, we're not getting that same odd behavior in the highlights in terms of things feeling both clipped out and too flat, if that makes sense. So it's a much better starting point, even though it may not look like a world of difference. And again, the other real benefit here is that you can use this input transform the way you would use any other input transform for any other camera, namely, however you wish. You can use it when you're color managing in nodes. You can use it if you're uh, color managing in your project settings. You can use it when you have a phantom uh, raw.cine file, or you can use it when you have a DNX or a ProRes or anything else that was encoded from the camera, not in RAW, or transcoded from the camera after the fact. So it's a much more dynamic and much more workable solution to color managing phantom footage than you get by default with uh, the solution of, that's available within Resolve. And let's just take a look at this shot and kind of observe the same thing. We can go in and grade it up and find better results in terms of our highlight performance than we were getting in our prior image. So if we go and look at our before and after here, same kind of thing. We just have a little bit more detail in our top end, and we've still been able to get a nice amount of uh, snap or, or contrast up there in the high end as well. And of course, from here, the good news is we've effectively set up the same color management that I always show you guys here on the channel. We map into DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate, we do our grading, and then we go out to our display space, right? And in the same way, we can go over to our timeline level and we could audition any looks that we wanted to. I could audition something from my uh, print film emulation set, my 2383 or my Fuji 3510. These are both free downloads that you can get your hands on uh, that I'll leave links to uh, in the description for this video as well. And you can take a look and get some film character uh, in your images quite easily. That's going to change maybe your grading decisions that you would want to make underneath, but you can get that character in there or you could use something from uh, my Voyager pack, either the Pro pack or the Essentials pack, and get a whole different vibe with that approach. Like, that looks really good to me. And I'm able to get to the same type of workflow that I would want to have with any other camera, even though this is a phantom that normally causes me big problems because I can't color manage it in the way that I am accustomed to, where now I can color manage it just like I would any other image. I'm really excited to share this with you guys. I hope you enjoy working with it and find uh, as much value in it as I have. We've been testing and working on this for about six months and I've used it on a bunch of projects now. And I can tell you that a lot of the like longstanding itches and problems that I've had with phantom footage, that highlight thing that I keep mentioning being the main one, that's largely remedied with this input transform. And maybe the even bigger solution is that I can use this input transform wherever and however I wish, instead of being kind of backed into a workflow that I really don't want to use simply so that I can properly color manage my phantom footage. So check it out. You can download it. Let me know what you think uh, in the comments. And I'm excited to, see, to hear how you put this to work in your color grading workflows to make phantom footage look its absolute best.